So, uh, welcome everybody to this new session of the Simna Seminar course. Today, we are very pleased to have with us Dr. Camilo uh, Zamora Ledesma. Uh, Dr. Zamora is an experimental physicist with a PhD prepared in the framework of a cocktail with the Université de Montpellier and the Universidad Central de Venezuela. Since 2021, he joined the Green and Innovative Technologies for Food, Environment and Bioengineering Research Group, Faculty of Pharmacy and Nutrition in Universidad Católica de Murcia, as full-time researcher and research staff. His research activities are mainly focused on the synthesis, on the th synthesis of tailored organic and inorganic nanomaterials, materials based on nanocarbon and nanoparticles, and the active molecules for potential applications in food, environment, and bioengineering. And Dr. Camilo, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, thank you for the invitation for this uh, conference. Uh, I want to thank uh, Ignacio, Pavel, Christian for the invitation uh, to show today a few of our past, uh, our past research uh, projects in some of the ongoing projects you are working with. <clears throat> today, I'm going to talk about uh, the fabrication of uh, electrospawn fiber mats. Uh, for applications in the field of tissue engineering and water treatment. This is here. Okay. So this is the outline of the conference. I'm going to spend uh, like a few few minutes just to introduce uh, where I'm working and uh, uh, what I what I'm doing. Then I will uh, introduce a little bit about the fabrication of this. Uh, uh, I can call this additive manufactures in order to produce materials via electrospinning mainly. Uh, and then I'm going to discuss a few of the our latest work related for the fabrication of electrospool material for tissue engineering, water treatment. I also going to show you uh, a couple of uh, work we have done related to simulation numerical and numerical uh, methods we can use to, call to, to for this kind of application. Then I'm going to conclude on some of the output of, of this. So for those that don't know where we are, we, our university, the Universidad Católica de Murcia, is located in the region of Murcia. Uh, it's, a, <clears throat> it's a private university, and it's located in the Monasterio de San Jerónimos, which is a, it's a building which is uh, uh, recognized by the UNESCO as Patrimonio UNESCO. And it's a, a church, a very old church, and they, <clears throat> the, the campus is around this uh, church. Uh, just to give you a, a, a fact about the, this university, at this time in 2023, we are 10 faculties. We also have a 32 bachelor degree, five PhD program and master program. I belong to the PhD in health and the PhD program regarding the engineering. Okay, we are almost 21,000 students in 2023. Uh, I'm working, I work physically in this new building. This building was launched in 2021, which is, is a, like a hub for research in sport health and, uh, and nutrition. And, it's okay. Yeah. No, okay. Okay, thank you, Pavel. I'm here. <laughs> Thanks for joining us. <clears throat> okay, so this building was uh, recently launched in 2021. In 2000, it's at the end of 2021. 
And here the, the, the idea of this hub is to do research regarding health, as I mentioned, health, uh, applied to health, sports, and nutrition. <coughs> and this is some of the picture we have, different facilities overall for the health department. But also this is a building which is thing, which was uh, built like a, to have a space in which companies, startups, and research can work together in order to promote entrepreneurship, uh, etc. Creation of new company, uh, etc. Recently, in 2022, we create our our research group, which is called the uh, Pembet. Embed is uh, uh, a group which is uh, created by the Vicente Gomez Lopez, which is the head of the group, Patricia, which is also a professor in the UCAN, and myself. And this uh, uh, Vicente and Patricia, they are more focused on environmental and overall uh, nutrition. They are uh, Vicente is biologist with a profile in science, food science and technology, the same for Patricia. And the main research lines are the use of opulsive light. Actually, Vicente is one of the precursors of this technology, use it for food and environmental application, use of very high energy pulsed light for different applications. And also they are trying to use another uh, physical methods apply it to food and environmental application, like a high power ultrasound, microwave assisting extraction of essential oil from material, from plants, etc. And myself, I am in charge of the, this uh, axis, which is the development of novel materials and devices applied to food, environment, or bioengineering. <laughs> okay, uh, this is a few of the equipment we have. This is just, I give you a good idea. But overall, we have in my, in my axis, we work with fabrication of different material like hydrogel, zero gel. Uh, I, we have also a couple of work regarding 3D printed by myself. I am in charge of this uh, electrofinning machine. And also we have all the facility and infrastructure to carry out um, in vitro uh, experiment with bacteria, different type of bacteria and also with different type of cells, human cells, animal cells, uh, fibroblasts, uh, mesenchymal stem cells, etc. So this is a, uh, we have all the equipment to do this, this, uh, this uh, experiment, which allow us to uh, try to, uh, to make the assessment of the bioactivity, biocompatibility of the material we prepare in the, <coughs> in the lab. Okay, regarding electrospinning, I just want to, to mention the most important part. Uh, uh, electrospinning is based on the electrodynamic, and the electrodynamic uh, EHD uh, of liquid is a transport phenomenon which describes the motion of the liquid trajected and electric field. In other words, uh, experimentally, what uh, we are doing in, in electrospinning is to, I think I cannot. Uh, no, okay. What we are normally doing here is we prepare a solution, uh, normally a precursor, can be organic and inorganic using polymers. Uh, I saw some papers working in organic material like ceramics. And then you can prepare a stable solution, and this stable solution is uh, put it into a syringe foam, and then you apply an electro uh, and dif uh, potential difference in order to create an electric field here. And this electric field is the responsible to create different shape of the particles, like a, a micro, like a particles, fibers, porous fibers, hollow fibers, etc. There are plenty, plenty no, but there are some different setup configuration for this machine. So you can really, really, it's very versatile. You can do organized fiber, you can do disorganized fiber, hollow fiber, porous fiber, a smooth surface fiber. So, it's very versatile, so you can use this material for different applications. Uh, as far as my knowledge, as far as uh, we are concerned, we already have done some work for improve the mechanical property of material using in aeronautics, uh, different fields. So we are we are doing 
some material for using like a, right now like a like a wound dressing patch. Also, we have done some of this work in order to make some grow of cells, etc. So it's very versatile this material. Uh, however, it is very tricky to produce these materials uh, because you have too many parameters from the experimental point of view, and they are summarized here. Normally, uh, we have you are going to have three main factors which affect the final performance of these uh, materials. One of them is the solution parameters. The second, okay, the second one is uh, the process parameter, and the and the third is the surrounding condition. Regarding the the solution parameter, you have a parameter like a viscosity, surface tension, conductivity, dielectric constant, solvent volatility, concentration. Uh, regarding the process parameter, you have the electric field, the flow rate, the tip collector distance, the surge orifice diameter, electrostatic potential, so the, the voltage. And then you have the surrounding condition regarding the environmental condition, like a humidity, temperature, pressure, atmospheric composition, local atmosphere, and flow. If you want more detail about this, there is a nice review. I put just there. It's a nice review. It's not for us. It's another research group, which they were discussed this into detail. Okay. I just wanted to mention here, uh, some of these parameters are uh, really, really affecting the final morphology of the, of the fibers. But uh, as I mentioned, this is very tricky because it depends on many parameter means. I mean, when you change one parameter, for instance, the viscosity, uh, it's very hard to keep the other, the whole, the other parameters uh, constant. So you need to change few parameters in order to get uh, like a trend. But uh, in many cases, for instance, if you increase the, the viscosity, you can change, for instance, for a single system, for a given polymer, given polymeric solution like PVP, PVA, or uh, I don't know, PEN, a polymer solution, if you increase the viscosity, you can pass from uh, the production of uh, spheres, like a particles, to bed beaded fibers, fibers with the less bead and single fiber morphology, like it was, like a, is like a the HMA schematization, show in the top part, okay? But so, as I mentioned, uh, it, it's very tricky, but this is one of the main trends when you use a different viscosity, vis different viscosity. Another interesting properties overall for our application, we are looking for application regarding uh, water treatment, regarding uh, absorption of contaminants, also regarding the drug delivery systems, it's very important to play to play with the surface of the of the of the material, because here uh, when you pass from a smooth surface to a porous surface like this, you also increase the active sites, you increase the uh, specific surface, so you can gain a lot of. Uh, uh, this surface allows you to, to gain in, for this type of application. And normally, this type of fiber can be produced by adjusting uh, environmental condition like humidity. So if you put some humid environment into when you are fabricating these uh, fibers, you can pass from some smooth fibers to some porous uh, uh, fibers. Okay, you also need to change maybe the solvent, you also need to change the polymers, etc. Okay, but this is just to... Yeah. Here, I also wanted to summarize a few of the parameters you can play with and what is the effect on the nanofiber properties. For instance, as I mentioned, you can, if you increase the viscosity, I mentioned in the present slide, that you can pass from beaded fiber from 
particle beaded fibers to fibers without beads. But also when you increase the viscosity, if you leave all the parameter constant, you can uh, increase the fiber diameter. The same, if you increase the concentration, the fiber, the fiber diameter increases. Um, I don't know, other, the, other interesting parameter is the surface tension. If the surface tension increase, you can have the bit formation and you can play with the surface tension by changing the solvent. You can change, use different type of organic solvent like GMF, THF, uh, alcohol, ethanol, etc. Or also, in some cases, we are forced to use some surfactant which are uh, very sensitive to the surface tension. Also, the boiling point of the, of the solvent, the density. And on the other hand, if you change to the experimental parameter like a voltage, you can increase, typically, if you increase the voltage, you can increase the fiber parameter. I'm citing here the, the paper when which they established this. If you increase, the, for instance, the flow rate, you also increase the fiber diameter and so on. And regarding the environmental factor, if you, for instance, if you play a little bit with the temperature and you increase the temperature, you can reduce the solution viscosity, which can result in some of the uh, bead formation or beaded fiber formation in this morphology. Okay, so <clears throat> uh, now I wanted just to introduce uh, our recent work regarding the fabrication of electrospun fiber mats for tissue engineering application, specifically for the uh, fabrication of a uh, drug delivery system and also a system thing uh, which can be used like a bone dressing material, okay? So this is the experimental setup we use as typical, a very normal, typical experimental setup. And now we are working with different type of natural, biocompatible uh, polymers. Typically, we are working with sylfibrin, which is produced from the cocoons from the bombix mori, okay? We are also trying to do some experiment regarding the combination of sylfibrin with collagen, sylfibrin alone. Also, we are using polycaprolactone, which is a very biocompatible material. Also, we are using PBA, uh, PAN, you will see. And then there are some different molecules we are interested with, which we call this uh, bioactive molecule, like a growth factor, antimicrobial biomolecule, agent and biomolecules, etc. The main application, drug delivery and wound healing, okay? And as I mentioned, we, can, we are interested because we have two accessories. Uh, we have a, a drone, which allow us to produce uh, a bigger surface, bigger mat, bigger fiber mat. And also we have a double syringe foam system, which allow us to produce a core shell particles or core shell fibers. This is one of the ongoing projects in our research group, okay? So uh, as I mentioned, I work into the bone, into the this, uh, uh, like uh, in the middle, I am the middle uh, of the material science, biology, and medicine. Actually, we are trying to use material for medical use based on different clinical needs. And in order to produce the material, we perform the different physicochemical studies, but also biological studies through in vivo and in vitro material. What we are looking for, we are looking for make some application in the tissue engineering, like steam regeneration, bone cartilage regeneration, drug release, wound healing, maybe nerve, nerve regeneration or vascular regeneration. Okay. This is the present work I wanted to discuss today. This uh, work we have done last year, actually, this was also carried out with uh, one student from Montpellier, which visited our lab last year, uh, like an intern. We were working on the fabrication of fiber mat for like wound healing and drug delivery system. And we use like a precursor, so a typical biocompatible polymer, which is the polyvinyl alcohol. And we use the retinol, which is a vitamin, which is 
widely used for different applications in skin, in tissue engineering, okay? The goals of this work was to fabricate membranes based on these polymer and bioactive molecules. Also to find the, let's say, the optical recipe and the optical material with adequate mechanical, physicochemical, and biological response. We were looking for uh, uh, the evaluation of the biocompatibility of these materials. Also, we studied the mechanical properties of this material. And as I mentioned, these materials can be applied, uh, we do believe that can be applied for different applications, like wood healing application, drug delivery systems, et cetera. What we have done, we prepared them in the, the electrospinning, like uh, in the needle. Now we have done biological assay by using cytotoxicity and proliferation in mesenchymal stem cells. We also have done some physical chemical assay. We have uh, evaluated the uh, in vitro release of the drug. In this case, it was the uh, retinol bit, and also the mechanical properties of the material. There are some interesting properties we, we found in this uh, work. First of all, as you can see in the bias, this is typical representative bio containing more or less 10 milliliters of uh, the mixtures. As you can see, they are homogeneous. And as a, when we increase the content of retinol, you pass from something transparent. So the, the first is just the PVA and the, the, on the right side hand, you have the different bias when you add the retinol. So they, they became like a, tur the turbidity increased, they became like a whitey, and they are really stable, it's not, you, you, you are not capable to see a phase separation if you keep this into, uh, with environmental condition, we keep this into a fridge, because we observe that this system can be unstable or as a function of the temperature. Besides, when we lower a little bit the temperature, Actually, these uh, materials uh, create a gel, like a hydrogel. And actually, this is, was really interesting because uh, we, did, we published last year an, another paper just regarding this. We wanted to measure the ability of using these PVA hydrogels doped with vitamin retinol uh, for the growing of mesenchymal stem cells. And we have found a very interesting a promotion of the proliferation of the cell using this system. And have this material has a different application in tissue engineering. So these uh, solutions were homogeneous, stable over the time. They form a, a show gel like a structure uh, and depend on the temperature. And here, as you can see, when we transform this uh, precursor into the fibers, we obtain only fibers uh, without any beads. So we can control the mechanical properties. However, as you can see here, uh, or, uh, a good thing is you cannot, you, you also, the um, diameter of the fiber are not uh, modified when you add more or less uh, retinol. So this is a good property we wanted to keep. Uh, however, for some biological application is not uh, clear at all if the beaded fibers can promote or can be like a drawback for the growing of cells or bacteria. But in any case, in our case, we were interested to produce a single fibers like uh, we show here, we make the histogram. With the histogram, we can just estimate the, uh, the average diameter and uh, we don't have a significant difference between the old sample we have prepared. Okay, we also have checked in these fibers uh, the, with, using thermogravimetric analysis, uh, just to see what happened, for instance, with the crystallization of the polymer, when we introduced the, the, the retinol, we found more or less similar uh, results. As you can see here, when, however, the, <coughs> the temperature uh, changed a little bit from 312, to 313A when you add too much uh, of retinol. And we will also, we will see that we decided to use the this uh, very high load of retinol just in order to see what happened with the biological response. And we actually we actually 
we have found typically uh, that uh, above a certain concentration, the, the material is not good for cells. But from the mechanical point of view and from the physical point of view, physical chemical point of view, the materials uh, doesn't doesn't show any dramatic change. Here, for instance, we have plotted here the the stress strain of these fibers, and we summarize here what we what we obtain. You can see that the young modulus uh, dramatically decrease when you dot the material when you add. The, the the retinol to the system, but on the other hand, the elongation the the uh, elongation at break is uh, increased like a uh, two hundred or almost four hundred percent as you can see over here, and then the ultimate tensile strength also is more or less like uh, from two to four. You can modulate in this way the mechanical properties. Um, when you change the, the content of the bioactive molecule. So uh, I wanted to show, I emphasize this, because then what we have done here, we, we have uh, assessed a different concentration and we wanted to see which of these material has the better uh, biological response, but at the same time, which one of them has the adequate mechanical properties in order to then at the end, we wanted to choose the, 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 the best material with the best possibilities to get an application in the real life. The other thing we have uh, evaluated in this uh, work is how is the drug released to the to a liquid media? This is done in order to, to mimic a uh, human, the human body. And normally for the human body uh, evaluation, the material is going to be in contact with fluids, and this is what we have done in, lab, in the lab. So we, we, we saw this material into a saline buffer like PBS, and then we evaluate how much of the drug is releasing over the time. Here is the release of the material over two weeks. Um, for skin applications, you are more interested in how much of the drug is released in the first 72 hours or in the first week. However, we wanted to evaluate how, what happened in two weeks. And this is not the common way in order to, to, to show the drug release. Normally, you, you show the drug release as a function of the how, uh, which is the percentage of the drug present in the material released to the medium. However, I wanted to show how many milligrams is released into the system because I was thinking about uh, for a real application, you need to know actually how many milligrams are you releasing to the to the body. So maybe this is not this is not the, the the common way to show this. But in any case, we were capable to show that we can deliver from 0.5 to 2 milligrams of this uh, uh, of this uh, drug in in one week or two weeks, depending on the context of the initial content of the drug in the material. Then we have done some biological tests. We evaluate the biocompatibility of the material. As you can see here, in the first, on the left-hand side, we evaluate the cytotoxicity. You see the LDH cytotoxicity assay, uh, which allow us to estimate if our material is cytotoxic or not, or not in the presence of mesenchymal stem cells, which are human cells, which are extracted from the bone marrow, bone marrow extracted, okay? And normally, according with the literature, everything below 20% of this, uh, cytotoxicity, uh, of this cytotoxicity assay is considered like a non-cytotoxic. So if we take into, into account this definition, all our materials are not cytotoxic. Instead, the only cytotoxic material, as we can see here, is the material which is loaded with 5% at the beginning after 72 hours. So if this is a proof, and this is in totally agreement with the literature, that for a higher dose, this uh, retinol is not good for the cells uh, 
and also for the cell proliferation. On the right hand side, we have done some proliferation assay. It also has done in days, up to 14 days. We use the Alamar rule assays for making the proliferation of the cells. And uh, we have several anise proliferation for all the samples. However, there are no significant difference. And once again, we have a, a, here, if we compare that in 14 days, we have a nice proliferation for all of them if we compare with the control. And the material, which was uh, cytotoxic, uh, also have a lower proliferation, which is in total agreement with the results. Okay. Another uh, biological assay that is very important for this kind of application is something that is called the wound healing assay. This is a very simple uh, assay, which consists into having the cells up, up to the cells are confluence. Then you, you make like a scratch uh, on these cells and you measure the, the velocity of the, the healing of this uh, wound in the, into the cells. And this is what this was done for all the materials. And what we have found that after uh, 24 hours, uh, after 72 hours, as you can see there, the whole uh, sample provide a full wound closure. However, once again, the, 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 the one with the higher uh, retinal content uh, as expected, because this was cytotoxin, it was not uh, capable to close the wound. Regarding the, <laughs> so this is the one, the work we have uh, submitted uh, recently in, in January, uh, it's uh, under review. Now I wanted to show you a few of the work uh, related with the water treatment application, and actually related with one of the projects uh, you will see here. And why we are interested into works uh, to fabricate materials for uh, water treatment application. First of all, uh, the water treatment uh, is a worldwide concern. And actually, the, the real problem is, uh, uh, is regarding the, the waste water treatment worldwide. If you look at a little bit the, 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 the numbers about the waste, the waste water treatment worldwide, you will see that in the in Europe, for instance, you have a very developed uh, waste water treatment uh, procedures. But however, in other countries like in Latin America and Caribbean, this is a very huge problem. So we have, we are producing a lot of waste water, and we are not uh, producing uh, efficient uh, wastewater treatment. Uh, regarding Ecuador, uh, which is the main goal of one of the internal projects uh, mm, uh, approved the, here in the UPC, is regarding we are we pro, the, the project is regarding the waste water treatment in Ecuador. If you look at in the in Ecuador, uh, it's produced like a 0.46 kilometer cube per year of waste water is produced and only the 35% of this uh, waste water is treated. So there are a huge amount, like a 65% of water that need future in the future uh, the, 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 to treat in order to, um, to promote a more sustainable environment. Regarding the water pollution, you have different concerns. The, you have different concerns and different pollutants. Of course, you have, first of all, microorganisms. You have uh, different bacteria present in the water that in higher dose are very bad for the health, for instance. Then you have other very hard, harsh materials like a heavy metals or persistent pollutant or emerging con contaminants. Uh, here, I just wanted to mention the most important uh, contaminant in water. If you wanted to take a look more into detail of this, uh, not only the, the pollutant, but also the different way you can treat uh, this uh, pollutant, you can take a look at this to review uh, with, uh, 
we have uh, published recently regarding the water treatment application. This includes the use of nanomaterial, the use of fiber, the use of different combination of manufactured additive in order to produce efficient uh, system for water treatment, was water treatment. Okay, one of the recent, uh, let's say one of the most important pollutants besides the heavy metals and bacteria are also some that is called emerging contaminant. Why? Because these are produced from industrial, from industrial uh, uh, wastewater. And we produce ton of this. The, maybe here you can see the, this emerging contaminant, like uh, the more famous, like uh, caffeine, triclosan, ibuprofen, are present in the, in the water. So this is a very problem, a problem very high for many, for many, for many countries and many cities. This is the one PSD thesis I'm directing from Ecuador actually, which are study the, the contamination of emerging contaminants using local source. So how you can uh, remove contaminants from water? There are plenty of different uh, ways. You have uh, like a biological ways, hybrid ways, but we are more interested into uh, um, produce treatment based on physical and chemical uh, treatments. Physical treatment like a nanofiltration is one of the most famous in order to, to produce water treatment. And also you can use different chemical treatment in order to use like a producing ozonization, UV photolysis, using particles, etc. And the mechanism for the, the contamination of the water is mostly based in the absorption process. So in this, let's say in this uh, material we prepare, we prepare like a, a material with which we combine the particles with polymers and the particles are the responsible to absorb the contaminant, okay? But this is one of the, the idea. However, this is a very efficient in order to remove uh, in low scale, but when you wanted to make high scales, a water treatment process, you will face another problem, which is the bioaccumulation. This is another issue you need to deal with. <clears throat> One of the projects, as I mentioned, this is as in an internal project uh, in which we participate with Christian Narvaez, another colleague from Ecuador from the Universidad Técnica of Manaví. We were, we were in this project, the idea is to produce membrane, which are called a multi-layer membrane using electrosmooth, electrosmooth multi-layer membranes. Uh, the idea is to remove not only micro, microorganisms like uh, bacteria, but also some other pollutant like uh, uh, oils and sediments, and also to remove some of the heavy metals present into the water like uh, chromium, cadmium, mercury, etc. Uh, one of the uh, the results uh, in a ready study were this uh, here. So you can use this multi multi-layer membrane, which is composed of nylon, polyacrylonitrile, and chitosan. And you can use this uh, multi-layer membrane in order to reduce the chromium and the cadmium. And we, you have done this reduction from the cadmium you can get like a 80% of reduction in both, in both cases. So in the same, the same uh, methodology, you produce a solution uh, with different uh, polymers, and then you make the electrospinning, you create your multi-layer membrane, and then you use uh, the filtration in order to produce this remotion for, for these two heavy metals. Also, we can use uh, like, uh, we can show there, I will show this, Later is a paper we published in 2021 regarding the fabrication of electrospin material with silver nanoparticles in order to uh, uh, clean, to produce, uh, to decrease the, the microorganisms present into the, into the water. This is the project I was discussing about. Is the, uh, in, this, in this paper, we evaluated the influence of the ultrasonication uh, on the property of the production of these uh, 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 fiber mats produced by electrospinning 
using polyacrylonitrile, PAN, and silver nanoparticle. As you know, it's widely known from the literature the use of silver nanoparticle has uh, intrinsically uh, very interesting antibacterial activity. So we wanted to combine the antibacterial activity of the nanoparticles with a polymer in order to produce a membrane which is capable to remove some microorganisms uh, from the water. And this is the more or less the graph, the table of content of this project. First of all, we just produce the, uh, we produce uh, the materials. Uh, in this case, we, we bought the silver nanoparticle already from a Chinese supplier. Then we mix together with the PEN, with a solution of PEN and DMF. We produce this uh, with sonicate a little bit. And actually, we wanted to measure uh, if we change the time of the ultrasonication bath, which is the influence of the dis dispersion of the particles in the membrane. And also, if this has an impact into the removal of the microorganism. So the goal was to fabricate membrane based on these polymer nanoparticles, evaluate the homogeneity of the nanoparticles uh, due to the ultrasonication, which is their functionality performance to remove to remove polytons, and then to evaluate the mechanical properties. Yeah. So this is more or less what we have done before. We just first evaluate the viscosity, the shear stress versus the shear rate, just to evaluate a different a content of silver nanoparticles. And as you can see here, if we change the weight percent of these particles, you can change also the physical properties of the solution, the precursor solution. And we also use XRD in order to identify both the, the nanoparticles and the uh, polymer. It's not very obvious, but when here you have the silver nanoparticle with the specific peaks, black peaks, corresponding to the crystallographic uh, diffraction from the silver nanoparticle. This is the typical diffraction pattern from the polymer. And when you create the composite, the predominant signal is coming from the polymer. However, you can uh, identify uh, the, the main peak for the silver nanoparticle in the diffractogram. So then what we have done we here, we change the concentration of the polymer and we make uh, the morphology because we were looking for uh, having the best condition for the polymers and the fibers. And we have done different concentration from 8, 10, 12% and 40% of the polymer. And then what we have done, we choose the best one. So we choose the B. And then from the B, which is 10% uh, of the polymer, then we choose this concentration and we start to doing our mixture with silver nanoparticles using a solution, a precursor solution of PAN, about 10%. And then we do the contrary. We change the percentage of the content of silver nanoparticles from 6, 8, 10, and 12%. Here you can see a very nice picture using electron diffraction spectroscopy in which you can see the presence of the different nanoparticles and nanoparticles aggregate on the fibers. And here are the typical TEM picture of the nanoparticles we use. And in the bottom part, you can see the effect of the ultrasonication time on the aggregation of the particle on the fibers. It's obvious that the homogeneity of the dispersion of the particle increase when the time of the ultrasonication time increases. So then for the next uh, work, we decided to fix the PEN to 10%, also the time, the ultrasonication time at 30%. And what we have found is that you are really uh, capable to remove, for instance, these are already the water treatment uh, results. We use uh, water with the different uh, content of Echerichia coli, aureos and albicans. And we found here, as you can see, when you use the composite, which is the blue one, you are really uh, removing, for instance, uh, Staphylococcus aureus albicans. 
And if you compare with the control, this is not very effective, but here is more or less effective for this type of microbials. And also, as you can see here, you can also uh, use these uh, materials in order to remove the uh, fecal coliforms. Okay, this is a, this experiment have been done into a batch process, <coughs> and as we highlight there, the PEN uh, silver nanoparticle is effective for albicans and Echerichia coli Okay, this is the main result. Finally, I just wanted to introduce a little bit of how what we have done regarding modeling and simulations uh, in a work presented re reported in 2021 we were developing we were evaluating uh, the impact of the solvent in the structural mechanical properties of PB, PBP fiber mats and we have done and this time maybe this is interesting for you we had using density functional theory in order to do two different experiments. The first experiment we have done, or to compare, we wanted to compare our experimental data from FTAR uh, experiment with the calculated one. We found very nice coupling between the experimental and the calculation. As you can see here, I'm not going to into the details, but you have the detail here. So in the upper part, you have the FTAR measurement. In the bottom part, you have the DFT calculation, and they are really, really, really close. Mm -hmm. The other thing that we have done using some simulation model is to calculate the coverage and binding energy. So in this case, what we have done, we you put uh, using density functional theory, you put a PVP molecule, and then you evaluate the binding energy of a PVP molecule on this PVP, the ethanol molecule on this PVP, or the DMF molecule on this PVP. And you can see here that uh, the uh, overall, the binding energy of, of the P DMF is higher than the binding energy of PVP, and the, is more or less equal to the binding energy of the ethanol. And these results suggest or explain why DMF is more effective at inhibiting the crystallization of PVP than ethanol. This was contrasted with uh, some data from FTAR and thermogravimetry analysis to conclude this mechanism. We do the same in another work we have published in 2019. In this time, we were looking for the fabrication of particles, fibers, using uh, multi-wall carbon nanotubes, reinforced composites, we were trying to produce this nice phase diagram in order to find the stability belt in which you can choose the, uh, the, 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 the solvent and the PVP concentration if you are looking for only beads, only microspheres, or, or fibers or beaded fibers, okay? We also use the, the effect of multi-wall carbon nanotube on the mechanical properties, and we try to explain the mechanism. And once again, in this world, we have used density functional theory in order to compute the binding energy and the coverage. How is the, in this case, how the ethanol uh, is uh, covering the, uh, ethanol is covering the, the PVP, okay? <clears throat> also, this is one of the work of the Christian thesis. Is regarding the determination of the operational parameter using uh, the manufacturing of spherical PV particles. This is another paper published in 2021. So you can also use numerical methods in order to simulate the, 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 the shape of the particles. And this will influence a lot the, uh, the final performance of the material. So it's a very interesting from the numerical point of view to uh, do this calculation to find the operational order parameter, or the, for instance, the outset voltage. You also can, can use this in order to model the electromechanical properties. And this is one of the results from Nervais in which they use numeric, uh, numerical model in order to simulate how it how is going to behave the shape of the molecule as a function of the electric field. Okay? To conclude, 
Uh, I just wanted to mention that, the, of course, the electro fiber really, really a uh, good candidate for both application tissue engineering and environmental, like uh, water treatment applications. In our case, we are interested in both of them. The, for tissue engineering application, we are interested in developing materials more efficient, low cost for cosmetic, wound healing, skin cartilage regeneration, and more than others. It's very versatile, so you can associate, you can produce fiber mats using different types of more polymer from synthetic, organic, biocompatibles, but also you can use inorganic molecules, I don't know, like uh, some used in ceramics, which are also presently used. And then you can combine this with nanoparticles, with bioactive molecules, like uh, antibacterial, anti-inflammatory, vitamin. So it's an open issue still. The same for the treated applications, you can use the same methodology to produce the material, to produce uh, fibers, mats, for water treatment application. And there are plenty of current issues like uh, to control the aggregation of the particles, the low efficiency, the degradability of the material, the saturation of the material, or uh, absorb the contaminant. Uh, also the monetary concern, like uh, we are looking for the production of cost efficient materials. Uh, also there are plenty of sustainability concerns or there are many open issues. And also the other open issue regarding water treatment is that you need to produce a large quantity. And this is a very challenging when you wanted to pass from a lab scale to a company scale to a very day-to-day uh, uh, -day application, you need to produce large quantity, which is a big deal. And to control the physical chemical property and the biological response. So finally, I just wanted to invite you, if you have some of the paper already uh, to publish, you can, I invite you to click on this uh, uh, to special edition, the guest editor for electrospun nanofibers, for the advanced and future perspective. This is polymer. This is a Q1 uh, from GCR, and this is a Q2 uh, also in tech science. This is for material like a hydrogel for natural and synthetic materials used for tissue engineering, tissue engineering application. If you have a paper, a review paper, or a research paper, I invite you to submit your paper here. Okay. Finally, I wanted to thank all my collaborators uh, from the Universidad de Sevilla, Universidad de San Francisco in Ecuador, Escuela Politécnica de Ecuador from the UCAN and the University of Vienna. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for this wonderful presentation, Milo. Once again, welcome to Sydney. Maybe somebody has a question from the, the online. But uh, I, I have a, a little question. Yeah. In the, could you add the, 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 the hydrogel that you found with the, with the, with the team? I uh, have a problem here. Mm -hmm. No, we have a okay. Which is the question? Okay. Go. Mm. Few more, few more. Few more. Yes. Few more, I think. It's with the other journal, with the other journal that you found with the. Uh, this one, that one. Uh -huh. that one. So, okay, I just need to this. Okay. With the the solution at five percent, you found like uh, crystals, or it is a suspended crystal that you have, or it's only the the, the it, because it looks like a a crystal solution. No, it's a it's a gel. It's like it's a, a gel. gel. It's like a gel. Like uh -huh. a gel. An homogeneous gel. Okay, and you can postpone the one. At room temperature, you can postpone this material. But one is a uh, eight degree or four degree. They create a gel-like structure, a physical gel like and you cannot uh, more. You cannot. Uh, it's too viscous. Too. Okay. Thank you. 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 Th
doesn't pass the temperature decrease, it, it becomes like a, a solid again. Exactly. Okay. If you increase a little bit the temperature from 4 degrees to 24, the viscosity is reduced dramatically. You are not longer, you are not longer forming the gel and you can electrospin the fire. Okay. Do you perform a rheological test for the solution? It will be interesting to see the the transition the between the, 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 the phase transition that you have. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, as I highlighted at the beginning, I am physicist and I belong right now into a, I was in a hub specify uh, which is uh, focused on health, nutrition and sport. So the all the infrastructure uh, today in this uh, building is more for health, sport and nutrition. And we are slowly Putting some machine to 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 make uh, to strength the physical chemical characterization of the material. So for the moment we don't have the we have a however we have, we, we can measure the we have a viscosimeter, but it's a big viscosimeter and it's used for food. So you need to put like a liter, like a jar, like a, you know, like a jelly. And in our case, you know, we're working on very small bias. And we are trying to get the accessories in order to this because this is a very important for electrospun to evaluate the rheometry, the viscosity, yeah, exactly. and also for 3D printed. We have free paper on 3D printed. And uh, when you wanted to print by your material for 3D, 3D printing, it's very important to know. You know the, the, the properties of the solution. Of course, the logical properties of the solution. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you for coming, sir. Nobody has a question. I think so. Sí. Eh, te, eh, te escuchamos, padre. We, bueno, pues nada. A ver, ante todo, agradecerle a Camilo la charla. Muchas gracias. Y lamento no haber podido ahora estar en Barcelona. Uh, dentro de un rato nos vemos. Y lo, pero he podido básicamente seguir la charla mientras daba la clase. Así que uh, on and off. <risa> Muchas gracias. Gracias, Pablo. Gracias. Nos vemos, un rato. nos vemos de aquí en una hora. Sí. Gracias. We can close. We can close. Thank you for the invitation. I'm going to. Okay.